Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 172, we're going to talk all about power tube emissions. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Today's topic was thanks to a question from a viewer who wanted to know more about power tube emissions. So what are power tube emissions? Well, first we need to understand the difference between typical voltage gain tubes like the 6SN7 or 12AU7 and power tubes like the EL34, KT88 or our very own GU50. The vast majority of tubes are the voltage gain type. You see those in preamplifiers and in early stages of power amplifiers. And they're also used as phase splitters too. That's right. So basically you put in a lower voltage and you get out a higher voltage. Okay, now power tubes, so these are all power tubes here, are current pushers. And that current is measured in milliamps. So that's a small m, capital A, or uh, that is one thousandths of an ampere, otherwise commonly called an amp. An amp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason you need an output stage that pushes current is because your speaker drivers operate at low voltage, high current. So in order to get that big electromagnetic piston diaphragm moving, that was a mouthful. <laughs> you need current. <laughs> you need current. Now, could you imagine if they operated on the opposite? If it was high voltage, low current, and there was high voltage going to everybody's speakers? <laughs> well, you would have little notes on little transmission towers going across from your amp to your speakers <laughs> saying high voltage present with lightning bolts. Don't touch the speaker. <laughs> and of course, you, any little ones in the family would have to be kept out of the music room. Yep. <laughs> which would be a shame. Okay, so when we test a power tube, we set a precise operating point, similar to how your tube will operate in your amp. The operating point can be hotter, more or higher emissions, or colder, less or lower emissions. But typically your circuit will be biased in a sweet spot, roughly 70% of the maximum rating of your tube and as close to the middle of the available swing as you can get. Now Charles is going to set up a Wii demonstration to show you how this works in real time. And he's going to use um, our poor man's 300B monoblock, the GU50. Okay, we'll be right back. All right, so here is our GU50 kit monoblock. And uh, we have a bit of a test set up here where what we've done is we've broken the cathode resistor for the GU50 power tube and we've wired in our decade box. Our high powered our decade. Our high power decade box, which is um, fantastic for doing development work. It, it made it so much easier once we started using those. How many do we have? <laughs> I think we're up to four now. Four, we've, maybe five. <laughs> we've rebuilt, repaired, modified them all. Anyways, they're fabulous to have on a bench. Yeah, so much easier than clipping in resistors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what we've done is we've we've uh, clipped in our decade box and we've broken our B plus going to the power tube over here and put in a current meter in the pathway so we can see how much current or the emissions of the tube actively as we change its bias point. Right, and we should maybe explain a little bit more about the cathode resistor. That sets the bias operating point of the tube yep. in our uh, cathode bias pure class A circuit. There's other ways to bias, but that's the way we've chosen. And okay, so. Um, so what we've started here is actually not our normal operating point. You can see that we're running around 62 milliamps and we've done up some handy load line charts here to show you what we've done. Oh, brilliant. And these are made on a website. You can see it up here. I've, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Vtaddy. Anyways, people can see that. And this is a fantastic resource for doing your own load lines and getting really nice looking ones on there. It's way easier than doing it on paper. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So let's talk about what we're actually seeing here. Let's start with 
Well, let's start over here. Yeah. So this side of the graph, we have our current. So this is the current that's passing through the tube. This is our emissions level. And over here, we have our, our plate voltage. And you can see this actually goes fairly high over here. Most tubes operate quite a bit lower. And these lines are representative of different points that the grid is operating at. So, so it's essentially an infinite graphing of all the operating points within the range of the graph, right? Right. And most tubes will start these at zero volts, but some tubes like the GU50 is able to operate a little bit in positive voltage on the grid. So I believe this is actually the 10 volt level and it goes down in equal amounts as we're dropping down these lines. And if we were on the positive side, we would not be in class A, we'd be in class A2. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whenever you're looking at these grid lines and you hear somebody say a tube is really linear, when they're talking linear, they're talking about the relationship between these lines and each other. So you can see the spacing on them here. It's very even. It's very even. And more importantly, even than that, the lines are very straight and parallel. Mm -hmm. So that shows you, and in fact, if you go ahead and look at a 300B uh, plot, you'll see that the lines are also very linear. And very similar to this also. But if you get down here in the area that we call the weeds, you can see that there's a more aggressive curve and that the linearity is lower. And this is where distortion starts getting introduced in this area. Okay, so this operating point that we have right now is actually what we would consider to be a colder bias point. So if we took your, your, um, your center value, mm -hmm and you brought it across, we would get what milliamp we emission? We would get 62 milliamps. Yeah. So that's the point from over here, straight across. Okay, let's take a quick look at the um, uh, the current setting that we were getting. Oh, we're and getting 60.2 milliamps. Exactly. So I was actually able to take the data of how the amp was built, its voltages and uh, bias point, put it into the calculator and get this number here and it's pretty much bang on what we have over okay, here. Okay, now why don't we try to uh, live on camera dial in the um, the high operating point that's that's at the other end of the spectrum. That, okay. That's really pushing the limits of the tube. All right. Without blowing up my <laughs> GU50, I love these tubes. They they are amazing sounding tubes, and we we killed a fair number of them during the development of the amp. Well, actually, we didn't kill that many. They, well, they can stand okay. some abuse. <laughs> a, be a better way of putting it is we tried to kill. Okay, you're going to hear some clicks here. Hopefully it's not too loud on the camera. So Charles is going to dial in the decade box. Essentially, he's, he's changing the resistance of the cathode resistor. So I'm increasing the resistance, which is going to change the bias point. And it's going to give us... Oh, hold on a second. I think I have the wrong one on here. <laughs> There's lots of dials on this thing. Uh, there we go. That should be the correct operator. Whoa, holy smokes. Okay, let's not hold it too long at 139 <laughs> milliamps. And I think we're showing a negative sign because we actually have our leads reversed. But anyways. It's but just... here is roughly... Actually, I think we're showing even more current now on here, but this is approximately where we're running. It's actually going to be a little bit higher than this now. And one thing that we didn't mention before is you see this curving line? The dotted following line. down here? That is the maximum emissions that the tube is rated for. So you have to stay below that line for the vast majority of the time. So right now it's idling above it. That's not good for the tube. We're not going to leave it on here for too long. You don't even actually want it to be sitting on that line. You, you want a little bit of space. Yeah, typically 70 to 80% of maximum emissions is, is pretty normal, but you could bias as cold as 60%. Yeah, and I can smell something almost burning here. So we're going to dial it down real yeah. quick. <laughs> yeah. I don't see any magic smoke, but we were in danger there. Yeah, these tubes get very hot. You can tell the reason why they put these uh, uh, Mykonol handles on them. <laughs> and Nobody even, wants to handle the glass. Or even the though our decade box is a high powered decade box, it does have its limits as well. So, mm -hmm. okay, so. So now we're at our operating point. This is the point that we chose for this tube. And you can see that we're actually sitting just below that max emissions line at a comfortable level. We're in a nice linear portion 
of the operating point here. So you should talk, you love talking about swing. Yeah. And uh, I believe grid zero is somewhere around here or here. And so that's the maximum point that you can go to without being in grid two. So this would be considered the top of the swing and an equal distance along the grid voltage would be somewhere around here. And that would be the bottom of the swing. Now, what is the swing? The swing is the, um, the distance that the power tube can move based off of the grid voltage, the uh, amount of current that can swing, the amount of voltage that can swing on it. It's essentially the, the room it has to move electrically. Okay. And the wider the swing, generally the better power that you have. Although, you can get a really wide swing if you don't care about distortion. If you go all the way down here, which, you know, we do care about distortion. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it was a guitar amp, you might want to be down in the distortion, but yeah. not for an audiophile grade monoblock, which is what the GU50 is. Now, so why don't you dial it in? So we're, we're somewhere, if we extrapolate that, we're what, 68, 69 milliamps something is our operating point? No, actually, we are all the way up around 90 now. Oh, we're at 90, okay. And let's take a look at the voltmeter here. And oh, you've dialed it in already, yeah, have you? Yeah, we've dialed it in, and we're just above 90 here. So, you know, the load line is going to do a fairly good job of predicting where you're going to be, but it's never going to be bang on. It's just going to be close. Okay, so what are some of the, now that we're at a safe operating point, so mm -hmm. this amp could sit on for hours without exactly. a problem. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things that people can learn from this? Um, higher emissions and lower emissions, testing emissions on a tube aren't necessarily going to indicate anything, right? Unless you know the testing conditions. The testing conditions. And mm -hmm. the best number to know is what is the center typical new old stock emission number. Yep. And the, at, at an operating point, at a B plus voltage and a grid voltage applied. Yeah. Uh, what's something else that's really important is that, uh, especially if you're new to amp development, is you do not want to bias your power tubes too hot because. No. You could have magic smoke instantly or yeah. in a very short while. Or if you turn your back to go and get a coffee, <laughs> you come back and there'll be magic smoke Ugh. or no tube anymore. And yeah. just a hole in the ground where it used to be. Oh, that reminds me of a story here where you had a customer email us not that long ago about his amp killing EL34s. And he explained to us that the amp had a high power mode and a low power mode. And so I looked it up and the high power mode pushed the EL34 literally to its absolute theoretical maximum that it could go. It was dissipating, I think it was something like 40 watts per tube. <laughs> and it was running at 800 volts on the plate. And he was wondering why the tubes get kept getting killed. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, stop operating it at the high point. <laughs> uh, this is a problem we're seeing constantly. A lot of new Chinese and even other manufacturers are copying circuits. Yeah. They actually don't have any engineering staff on hand. Now, Charles and I aren't electrical engineers. We're both self-taught, but we take great care in working from what's called first principles. So everything that we design, um, we start off with what is a safe operating point? What is a good circuit that we want to work with? And we check every single stage of that circuit, check the values of the capacitors, the resistors, mm -hmm. to make sure that everything makes sense, that it has good room, so that if it gets a little hot, it won't just die on you. But if you copy things, copy and paste, and you build your amp, oh, I think that stage will look good. You can end up with something that you don't understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and you could have consequences, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> like that gentleman. And his um, very hot EL thirty four. Yeah, <laughs> and we we're seeing this. Uh, this year has been the year of this. People are jumping on board designing equipment, and they have you can we can tell. And Charles is is going oh yeah. I'm going to actually hear, release some videos over on the Melotone Kids channel. You, um, you keep promising you're going to do it, but we're yeah. so the store is so busy. <laughs> the kid app business is so busy, hmm. and uh, we've got a new. Um, a new product that we're going to bring out. We'll be talking about it sometime soon. Hint, it involves high quality cables. Um, well, I think you might have just given it away. <laughs> do I give it away? Anyways, I'm really, I mean, the cables that our test sample cables, yeah. they brought our, our main listening system up one big serious uh, notch. We can't wait to show them off to you guys. Anyways, we're yeah. off topic and I'm bragging now, which I 
promise never to do. Yeah, but basically, there's a lot of amplifiers out there that are working off of bad principles, copied ideas that were just theoretical. And I'm going to do some videos where I take a look at some of these amps and explain what to look for in a new amplifier so that you avoid these, these really dodgy circuits and dodgy amps. I don't think we're going to name names and shame people, but I think oh. we're going to show what to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah, because it's it is tough to design equipment. I I mean we get that. We spend months and months. In fact, we've spent a year I think on the headphone kit amp trying yep. to get it really good. I mean, it started off sounding really good, but it's been getting <laughs> it's, it's progressively gets, gotten better with it gets, each iteration. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the other day you said, "Holy smokes, I can't believe it. It actually got better." It sounds even better. It sounds yep. even better. So, <laughs> but eventually we have to release it or we're going to go bankrupt. So, yeah. Wow. That's not true, <laughs> but it sounded good, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So hopefully that helps you understand a little better what your emission number on your tube is. A lot of, for for the buyer of a tube, it, a lot of it is relative. You need to know what your relative position is to the new stock emission number at a good operating point. Mm -hmm. And that's the last point I want to make. A lot of testers don't they don't test they don't power, do proper emissions tests. they don't do proper emissions tests. a lot of people testing power tubes and selling power tubes have no idea what they're doing mm -hmm. and even and i'm not going to name the name but even a really well-known commercial power tube tester that's available these days is using a uh, bad testing data a bad testing point yeah. and we can see how they did it they actually didn't know what they were doing and they picked up the, the wrong data off the data sheet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyways, um, well, what came in this week, Charles? All right. Well, uh, we're going to do another bit of movie magic jump cut here and uh, get this out of the way and make it safe. Okay. Well, we have slow weeks and we have uh, really busy weeks and we're about to have a really busy week. We've got a lot of inventory inbound. And a lot of really exciting inventory too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but to listen to as well. <laughs> I think last week or the week before, I announced a sale on one of our favorite six dg 8s which is the the Gen Sylvania, I should say Phillips Sylvania. Mm -hmm. Phillips bought the Sylvania company out in about 1980, and they just started rebranding. This one actually is branded Sylvania, but this is a Jan 6922. This is one of the best 6DJ8s ever made. There's actually a higher spec version than even this one called the 7308. Yep. They're a little rarer. And uh, anyways, I had announced the sale for this lovely tube. We, we got we got a lot we found a lot of them new old stock, new in the box, mill spec, just absolutely perfectly testing tubes. And I announced the sale and then I didn't set the store up properly. Somebody uh, fell into uh, the sale of the 7308 by accident, so they got a hell of a deal. <laughs> I put the wrong price in the wrong category. Anyways, the store is now set up properly, so if you are looking for one of the best 6DJ8s ever made at a reasonable price, new old stock, new in the box, uh, hop over to the 6DJ8 listing and you'll now be able to see which listing is on sale. Yeah. This tube. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, have I got the number out? The numbers help help a lot. I keep forgetting to yeah. put numbers out. 119N. Yeah. And if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we can reach almost everybody with flat rate $20 shipping. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. And I should mention that a few of our customers struggle a little bit because they're in high duty zones. And there's some strategies to... Uh, mitigating that uh, that expense and one of them is if you know someone traveling to the US or to Canada you can just get them to bring back your your purchase so we ship fairly often to hotel rooms uh, ahead of somebody arriving and if your country like many have a sort of a duty-free limit where you can just walk across the border and declare oh I have five hundred dollars because I've been 48 hours in our case with the US or whatever, whatever the the rule is with your customs, um, the, you just walk right through. You don't make a uh, customs declaration or anything. So depending on what country you're in, that's a good option. It could save you some money, yeah. And a lot of our customers in Europe use mail forwarders. 
And mm -hmm. if you use a mail forwarder, you set your customs declaration. So that can save a lot of money as well. And we've got discount codes. And somebody grabbed a whole bunch of them this week and uh, saved a lot of money. Well, somebody, a, a bunch of customers. We got slammed last week. Yeah, it was really busy. Uh, I, yeah. I think um, people are getting their refunds. <laughs> <laughs> Tax refunds. Yep. Yeah, so my most hated time of the year. <laughs> but anyways, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.